The Ghost Bird by Roland Smith Things were pretty dull in Hannah Gill's neighborhood until the day Mr. Tanner reported seeing the ivory-billed woodpecker. Reading the newspaper article about the sighting, Hannah's older brother, Martin, said, That old coot is loony. He is not, Hannah insisted. The ivory-billed woodpecker hasn't been seen for over 60 years, Martin shot back. It says so right here. The bird is extinct. That means gone forever. Tanner's just looking for attention. Mr. Tanner is. Hannah stopped and shook her head. She knew better than to argue with Martin, even if he was dead wrong, which in this case he had to be, because there was no one on earth who liked attention less than Mr. Joe Tanner. I'm going to talk to him, she said. Mr. Tanner lived a few blocks from the Gills in a three-story house built more than a hundred years ago by his grandfather. The Tanner family used to own all of Hannah's neighborhood and a good part of the county, but they had sold the land off section by section, piece by piece, until only the old house was left, plus 200 acres of swamp behind it. Mr. Tanner lived all alone except for Felix, a yellow-headed parrot nearly as old as he was. In the neighborhood, Mr. Tanner was known as the Birdman, but not because of the parrot. On his property were hundreds of birdhouses and bird feeders. He had nailed them to trees, poles, fence posts. Even the sides of his large home were covered with tiny wooden houses he built in his wood shop. The birds flocked to Mr. Tanner's property, which did not please his neighbors. They complained about the noise, their gardens getting eaten, and the mess the birds left behind, to which Mr. Tanner usually replied, My family sold you the land, but they didn't sell you the air. One day, Hannah had brought Mr. Tana, Tanner a bird she had found, a crow with a broken wing. He repaired the wing, and a few weeks later, they set the crow free. Hannah and Mr. Tanner had been friends ever since. As Hannah walked, she noticed a lot more traffic in the neighborhood than was normal for a Sunday morning. The cars were from unfamiliar, and the drivers were certainly not neighbors. A jeep pulled up next to her and rolled down the window. The driver had a beard and wore a pair of binoculars around his neck. Do you know where Mr. Joseph Tanner lives? he asked. Just around the corner, Hannah answered, pointing. Thanks. The man sped away. Hannah hurried after him. At least 50 cars were parked in front of Mr. Tanner's house, including a news van and two police cars. People were milling around his yard, some talking on phones, some talking to each other, some using their binoculars to scan the trees in the swamp behind the house. Hannah wandered through the crowd, catching bits and pieces of conversation. Tanner never saw no woodpecker. I tell you, he's crazy. Probably he saw a pileated woodpecker. People get that mixed up. He has a parrot, you know. What if he did see one? He was just putting that reporter on. Why doesn't he come out of the house? Hannah looked up at the window and saw a curtain move in one of the ground floor windows, Mr. Tanner's workshop. She walked casually over to the side door. Mr. Tanner always left it unlocked and slipped inside while no one was looking. Mr. Tanner turned around angrily when she came into the room but his features softened when he saw who it was. As always, Felix was perched on his shoulder like a feathered ornament. It's you, Mr. Tanner said, turning back to the window. Did anyone follow you in? I don't think so, said Hannah. Look at them, he said, like a bunch of turkey vultures on a carcass. What happened? That reporter from the newspaper came by to talk to me about what it was like around here before the houses got built. I just mentioned the woodpecker in passing, and wouldn't you know it, she wrote the whole blame article about me seeing the bird. So you really saw an ivory-billed woodpecker? Hannah asked. I've seen plenty of ivory bills in my life, Mr. Tanner answered testily. When I was a kid, they were as common as jays. I mean recently, Hannah said. He turned back from the window. What are they saying down there? Hannah told him. When she finished, Mr. Tanner hobbled over to his workbench with his cane. He had very bad arthritis, and some days he could barely walk at all. He pulled one of his many bird books off the shelf above the bench and opened it. This is a pileated woodpecker, he said, and there are at least three pairs in the swamp. He turned the page, and this is an ivory-billed woodpecker. 
The most striking difference between the two birds was their beaks. The pileated woodpecker had a black beak. The ivory bill's beak was the color of an elephant's tusk. Where did you see it? Hannah asked. Not it, Mr. Tanner said. Them, a pair. The male had a red top knot and the female's head was solid black, just like in the picture. He flipped back to the picture of the pileated woodpecker. You can see there that both ma the male and the female pileated have red on their heads. So I know what I saw were ivory bills. Where did you see them? Hannah asked. Right in my yard, Mr. Tanner said, and he sat down in his chair with a heavy sigh. What's the matter? I think they're still here, but I don't know which house they're in. I've been trying to find them, but my legs are giving me trouble, and my brain isn't working the way it used to either. I lose track of which bird is in which house. He gave another sigh. I get all mixed up. I get confused. Hannah had noticed this too. About a year ago, Mr. Tanner started drifting off in the middle of conversations. When he drifted back, he sometimes seemed startled to see Hannah standing there. If I could find the two ivory bills, people wouldn't think I was so crazy, Mr. Tanner continued. But more important, I might be able to save this property. What do you mean? Mr. Tanner didn't answer right away, and for a moment, Hannah thought that he had drifted off again. A beetle skittled, skittered across the sawdust-covered floor, reminding her that she needed to do a little house cleaning for her old friend. I'm worried about the birds, he answered finally. I've been trying to give this property to the state, but they don't want it. When I die, some developer is going to get a hold of the swamp, fill it with dirt, and build houses on it. What will happen to the birds? Where will they go? That's terrible, Hannah said. But how would finding the ivory bill help? We don't have endangered land laws in this country, Mr. Tanner explained but we do have an endangered species law. If I could prove endangered birds live here, the land would be protected forever. Then we'll just have to find them, said Hannah. Early the next morning, Hannah began looking for the ivory bills and quickly discovered what a daunting task finding the birds was going to be. It was no wonder Mr. Tanner had gotten confused. There were no vacancies in the birdhouses. She had to stand beneath, beneath each house and wait for a bird to return with food to find out which ones lived there. She was able to disregard the houses too small to hold ivory bills, but that still left hundreds of houses and thousands of holes drilled into the surrounding trees where birds had carved out homes of their own. When she got home that night, covered in mud, exhausted, her neck sore from looking up all day, she told her family that she was giving up. Gills don't give up, her father said. There are no ivory bills, Martin said. We'll help you, her mother said. And the next day they did, though Martin spent more time arguing than looking. There goes a starling, he would say. That's a blackbird, Hannah would correct. See the red and yellow on its wings? Prove it, he'd say. Hannah would have to open her book and show him the picture. Eventually, though, Martin stopped arguing with Hannah and actually started asking her questions. What do ivory bills eat? No one knows for sure, Hannah answered, but most ornithologists think they eat insects and larvae. Yuck. The gills saw a lot of birds on that first day and the next day and the day after. Mr. Tanner sat in his workshop window and gave them advice and encouragement. A week went by during which they managed to write down the location and occupant of every birdhouse, nest, and tree they could reach, but they did not see an ivory-billed woodpecker. I think this might be it, Mr. Gill finally admitted. The Gills had gathered on Mr. Tanner's front yard to go over their bird map one last time. We've checked every birdhouse and tree at least twice, Mrs. Gill said. Maybe those ivory bills he saw were just passing through, Martin suggested. I, best, I guess we better go in and tell him, Hannah said sadly. They knocked on the front door, but Mr. Tanner didn't come to open it. From inside, they heard the distinct and steady thunk, thunk, thunk. 
He must be building more birdhouses, Hannah said. He can't hear us. I'll go around to the side and get him. But Mr. Tanner was not in his workshop. She called for him. Up here, a weak voice replied. In all the time Hannah had known him, she had never seen Mr. Tanner upstairs. With his poor legs, he couldn't negotiate the steps. Up here, he said again. Thonk, thonk, thonk. He must be pounding on the floor, Hannah thought. She rushed up the stairs, two at a time. Up here. But he was not on the second floor. Hannah ran to, up to the third floor and found Mr. Tanner sitting at the bottom of a steep, narrow stairs with Felix perched on his bony shoulder. Are you all right? she asked. I'm fine, he said. I'm fine. I just had to take a rest after my climb. Thonk, thonk, thonk. The sound was coming from behind the small door at the top of the steps. Mr. Tanner was grinning. This is the birdhouse, he said. Beetles. And just think, I was going to call an exterminator. What are you talking about? They must have come in to eat the beetles, he said. Go up the stairs. Be real quiet. You'll see my trail in the dust. Follow it. Hannah climbed the steps. Behind the door was an attic. Before entering, she looked back down at Mr. Tanner, who was still grinning. Go ahead, he whispered. Hannah followed Mr. Tanner's footprints through the dusty furniture, trunks, boxes, and old paintings. The prints ended in front of a pile of wooden crates. Thonk, thonk, thonk. The sound was much louder now. Between the crates was a small gap. She peered through it and stifled a gasp of surprise. Not ten feet away were two of the most beautiful birds she had ever seen. One of them was hammering its ivory-colored bill on the floor and chasing the beetles that emerged from the rotting boards. The other bird was sitting on the nest. Beneath her were three downy heads. Go ahead and turn the page to the next article and listen to that article as well. Saving the Ghost Bird James Tanner dedicated his life to the ivory-billed woodpecker. But does the bird still exist? By Lauren Tarshus. It was 1935, and James Tanner was tramping through the swampy great woods of Louisiana, a vast land of century-old trees and grassy waterways. Tanner should have been looking down to make sure he didn't stomp on a water moccasin and wind up dead. But the 21-year-old student of ornithology, that is, the study of birds, had his eyes glued to the trees above. Tanner was searching for one of the most dazzling birds ever to soar through American skies, the ivory-billed woodpecker. America's largest woodpecker once thrived in the old-growth forests of the South. The bird was a stunning sight, blue-black with white lightning bolt stripes along its back. For centuries, the ivory bill had been one of America's most treasured creatures chopped to stumps. By 1935, most of the bird's natural habitat had been destroyed. The ancient trees where the ivory bills built their nests had been chopped to stumps and turned into lumber and paper. As the forest vanished, so did the ivory bills. By the time Tanner stepped into, these, into those woods, many scientists believed that the ivory bill was extinct. But that day in 1935, Tanner would prove them wrong. To his astonishment and joy, he discovered a pair of the birds with their baby nesting 45 feet up in a tree. Over the following months, he studied the family, keeping track of their every move, then published his observations in a book. He became a leading ivory bill expert and a fierce warrior dedicated to, save, to saving at least some small patch of their disappearing habit, habitat. Sadly, Tanner did not succeed. In 1941, much of the area of the Great Woods where Tanner had discovered the ivory bills was destroyed by logging. By the time Tanner died in 1991, he was convinced that the ivory bill was gone forever. But was it? Hopeful Hearts Over the past 10 years, several scientists and bird watchers have claimed to have spotted ivory bills, and many leading ornithologists are convinced that a few of the birds do survive. An anonymous donor has offered 50, 000, a $50,000 reward to anyone who can show proof that the bird still exists, 
and lead scientists to a living wild specimen. Now, hundreds of scientists and bird watchers are scouring the southern wilderness. Like James Tanner, they glue their eyes to the trees and keep their hearts filled with hope that the great ivory bill lives on.